Good afternoon. Um, welcome to uh, TechNet Cyber, uh, to the panel on quantum computing and its implications on cybersecurity. I hope you can hear me back there. All right, thanks, guys. Um, so we're just going to kind of uh, get started here. Um, thank you again for your time. So quantum computing, right? There are problems that even the most powerful classical computers are unable to solve because of the scale and complexity. Quantum computers are uniquely suited to solve some of those problems because of the inherent properties. During my research, I came across an interview by Dr. Christopher Moore talking about what, what is quantum, quantum mechanics and it's essential, essentially two rules. The first is quantum things can be in the state of zero and one at the same time, which is weird. I know we've all been trained with zeros and ones in, from, from school and most of in IT. And the second rule is it only happens when you're not looking, which is also, also weird. Uh, there's a theory about when the act of observing things changes the system itself, and which is some of the why we have some of th this panel to talk about not only opportunities in quantum, but what actually it means at, at the basic level. So with that, um, to talk about things like quantum algorithms, quantum information processing, heterogeneous quantum platforms, cryptography, and information science, I'd like to introduce my panel. Uh, on my far left-hand side is Dr. Elizabeth Iwisawa. She's a, she's a quantum technology lead of the Lidos Innovation Center, also called LINK, which uh, she's currently shaping Lidos's quantum strategy and research portfolio, focusing on key development areas in quantum communication, sensing simulations, and computing. On my immediate left is Mr. Re Nick Reese. He's a professor of emerging technology at George Washington University and New York University, and the ex-deputy ex director at emerging, emerging Technology Policy in the Office of Cyber Infrastructure, Risk and Resilience Policy at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Headquarters. He focuses on critical policy issues related to artificial intelligence, quantum information science, smart cities, space, and cybersecurity. So with that, I'd like to hand off uh, to Nick and Elizabeth to address the first thing. What is quantum computing? Can somebody help us with that? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll give it a, a try here. So uh, can you go to the next slide, Savaji? Thanks. So uh, so w in my role at DHS, we, we would uh, engage on this topic quite a bit. And um, in this, in, in uh, one of the things that we always noticed is that for a lot of, for a lot of folks, we weren't sure what the baseline was. What how much did you understand? How much do, certain, do folks understand about bits, qubits, why they're different, why that matters, and what difference that's going to make for you as an organization? So where we wanted to start today is to talk about quantum, the quantum world and the world that we experience. So the world that we experience, as you can see right there, that's the deterministic world. When an apple falls out of the tree, we know that it hits Isaac Newton in the head. When we add 2 plus 2, it equals 4 every single time, not 99% of the time, not with some level of probability, it equals 4 every time. And that's, that's a deterministic world that we experience. Can you go to the next slide? But in quantum, we, we experience a probabilistic world. So in the quantum world, 2 plus 2 doesn't equal 4 every single time. It equals 4 with some probability. <clears throat> and sometimes it equals 4 when we're not looking. And so, as, as Shivaji mentioned, so this is kind of the, the beginning of why the classical bits that we talked about, the ones and zeros, are different from qubits and why that's going to make a difference for you and your organization and your cybersecurity. So I'll give it over to Elizabeth as uh, she's the, the physicist and can do a way better job of explaining <laughs> this than I can. With the caveat that if anyone tells you they actually understand quantum mechanics, then you should not trust them at all because nobody does. Ah. <laughs> we can describe it with great accuracy. We don't know what it means and it's difficult to use. So next slide. Uh, so quantum technologies is a very broad field. We're here focusing on quantum computing, but cybersecurity is going to be impacted by comms, by sensing, by all kinds of these evolutions. It's basically tiny technology at a fundamental scale for the universe. So we're talking very specifically about quantum computing here, but you should be looking for other cutting-edge technologies and challenges coming out of these different fields as they develop. And all of these technologies leverage three main things from the quantum realm, which are a little bit odd. So one of them is the idea of superposition. So in the classical world, the probabilistic world, you have to be inside a box or outside of a box. You may not be both at the same time, but next slide, please. 
Um, in quantum, you can be both inside a box and outside of a box at the same time, which we can leverage to do a wide variety of calculations on quantum computers much, much faster than you can on classical computers, which is one of the threats that we're going to discuss later. So if you would go to the next slide. Um, I, I animate the old-fashioned way. So <laughs> we can also, um, how you ask questions about quantum mechanics changes the information that you get, which is differently alarming. No physicist wants to be told, I did an experiment, and the answer I got was based on the question I asked. So if you have a system that you can describe with, say, shape or color, you can either ask the system, next slide, uh, what shape are you, or what color are you, but you can't know both of these things at the same time. And that's one of the things that makes quantum computers very hard to use, is because the answer is in the computer, it's calculated very quickly, and you have to get it out. And you have to do this many, many times to get a statistical <laughs> likely answer. Um, next slide. And then the last thing that we love to talk about, which is entanglement, is when you can connect two systems in such a way that they fundamentally influence them each other, no matter how far away they're separated or whatever you do. And on a classical level, we're used to saying, look, if I have system A and it's combined of these shapes and system B, it's combined of these shapes, I get these four probabilities of environments that I can get out. But on a quantum side, this entanglement, um, if you'd go to the next slide, will actually force relationships that we wouldn't expect. If, say, one of them is a circle, the other one has to be a circle. There's no way to do it otherwise. And that's just a fundamental rule that exists and we can exploit. Um, so I'm going to toss it back to Nick, who's going to tell you about what that means on the computing side. Yeah, thanks. And so, uh, you know, if, if, if all of that was, you know, kind of a lot to handle, I, kinda, I, I completely agree because I've been living this for quite some time now. And what this means is that when we talk about... Uh, a classical computer, we talk about ones and zeros, right? So when you're doing a, when you're doing a calculation or you're displaying something on a, on a computer, it's a line of ones and zeros or computer words, right? So, but as the, the computer has to evaluate each one of those as a one or a zero, a true or a false, sweet or savory, whatever you want to call it, right? And it goes through that, that calculation um, to do any number of things that you do on a computer. Well, in a quantum computer, you can actually represent information as not a one or a zero, but as a one and a zero and everything in between. And so if you look at the, it's called a block sphere, that's the, the, the diagram there. So what that means is you can see that if you were to, let's say we were rotating this qubit, let's pretend that the sphere is a qubit and we're rotating it. So you could rotate it a kind of across that, across that x-axis and you could get a one or a zero. That's the way, that's the way it's described there. You could also do phase shifts. You could, you could, create, uh, you could create representation of information uh, on, on different phases, and you can create those, those, um, those representations um, as more than just a one or a zero. It's not one or the other. It's both um, with a probability. And so what, what eventually happens is, through a lot of very complex engineering, you can collapse that superposition, meaning what, what Elizabeth just talked about, you can collapse that into an answer to your, to your, uh, your calculation. And so we, there's a variety of ways that this is done. So the, the, the photo on the right is actually what a real quantum computer looks like. And so um, if you look at that, uh, you, might, you might have seen kind of the middle part before. It kind of looks like a golden chandelier. So that's actually where the, uh, the qubit is housed. But w the way you're looking at it right now, it's not operational because it's open. So if you look kind of to the back like left, you see that, that red cylinder. That cylinder would go up over top of the chandelier looking part, and then we would cool that down to uh, just a fraction of a degree above absolute zero in order to uh, be able to manipulate and control the qubits. So if you look kind of across the top, you'll see some pipes and things like that. That's actually the cryogenics. So cryogenics is a huge, huge part of being able to do quantum computing successfully. And it's a very complicated part of doing quantum computing successfully. And then if you look kind of behind it and to the right, you can see that there is a classical computing stack there that is a part of the quantum computing architecture. So when we give commands to qubits to spin, collapse out of superposition, things like that, we do it through a, a classical stack. And one of the things that's often missed when we talk about cybersecurity and quantum is there's actually cybersecurity of the classical stack that belongs inside a quantum computer. So we have to be careful of that as well. But just looking at, at, that, at that photo, I mean, that is something that you can stand under. I mean, it's a, it's a large, uh, it's a, it's a large uh, machine. And 
Uh, there are a couple of different types of, of qubits that are being developed. So IBM, Google are doing what's called Transmon qubits, and that's where uh, IBM has come up with uh, their 433 qubit uh, Osprey pot processor uh, last year. Uh, a couple other companies like Honeywell are doing Ion Trap, which is uh, they're using photons. So it's they're not as good at the deep calculation, but they are better at communication, meaning like a quantum internet or you know connected quantum computers. So can you go to the next slide? And this is this differs from the classical computers that we that we are used to. Or again, we talked about ones and zeros, right? If you want to l- represent a letter A, if you want to represent you know a percentage sign or anything like that. You have to do it through these binary, deterministic ones and zeros that run through, as, uh, that are represented as electric electricity going through logic gates. That is completely different, not better or worse. It is different than classical computers. So there are things that classical computers will continue to do. There are things that quantum computers will continue to do. So both will likely exist into the future, but both will have their cybersecurity challenges. And I'll throw it back to Elizabeth for the next slide. So before we jump a little bit more into why on earth does this matter to you, it's kind of interesting to think of the quantum computing world. They haven't picked their their transistors yet. So you can have photons, you can have these super cool computers, you can have trapped ions, you can have a lot of different options. But that doesn't mean you should be complacent about, you know, oh, it takes a lot of time to cool it or it takes, you know, we haven't picked a transistor so you can't be ready. Um, there are billions and billions and billions of dollars being poured into this globally. It is the most funded sector of quantum technologies in the world across the United States. And all of the capabilities that we talked about are most important because one of the first papers written about what a quantum computer could do, so as you were gathering, programming these is very difficult. You have to control cryogenics. You have to control spins and phases and flips and make entanglement happen. Uh, So the algorithms look different. But one of the first ones was how to factor numbers faster and a lot faster than classical computers, which is why we're talking about them in the con- uh, context of cybersecurity. So we talk about the Y2Q threat, which is the cute branding based on the millennial bug, if anyone remembers that. Um, <laughs> but the idea is, with the amount of innovation and the amount of money being poured into it, it is not unreasonable to expect what we call a cryptographically relevant quantum computer in about 10 years. And cryptographically relevant means we have enough infrastructure to calculate and break your RSA keys. In case you don't know what RSA is, I would hope you do, it's basically the encryption that we use almost everywhere. It is very, very populous. So because it can solve some of the basic problems, along with some of the other um, encryption methods there, this is a, these are general categories, Anyone who says it can break all encryption and we're going to have a cryptocalyx and everything's going to end and it's terrible, it's incorrect. There are other methods that we can use and do have, but the most common methods that we have are incredibly vulnerable. So the other concern is that even if we don't have a quantum computer right now, there's a cybersecurity attack called Harvest Now Decrypt Later where tons and tons of data are being stolen and stored with the understanding that sometime within their sort of security lifetime, there will be a quantum computer that could decrypt the data and gain access to the information. Um, The interesting thing is you also won't get the same kind of big splashy headlines of these cybersecurity attacks that we're used to using and having people galvanize into action because if anyone develops a quantum computer, the best thing to do on a threat front is to tell absolutely nobody and have your access to all the world's data unencrypted. So the idea that we want to kind of highlight is even on a aggressive timeline of a quantum computer could be cryptographically relevant in 10 years, um, that's about the time they expected it would take to roll RSA out globally across most of our infrastructure. And because any large infrastructure project always goes to time and always goes to budget, it actually took 20 years. So even if we started right now trying to completely update all of our cryptography, there's no, on the aggressive timeline, there's no way we'd get there in time. So that is the main takeaway, is even if it sounds distant and far away, and this is where we get into the boring nuts and bolts of it, preparing for that is such a monumental task that we don't have the time or the flexibility to wait. So next slide, please. Now, there's two very key different ways of approaching post-quantum, or any kind of cryptography that is resilient to a quantum computer. So on the left, there's post-quantum cryptography, or what we call PQC, and these are classical solutions. So even the word quantum is in the title, there is no quantum in this solution. It is classical things such as um, lattice-based cryptography, things that NIST is exploring right now. Um, 
I put some examples up there, but it's standard familiar ground. Um, the other kind of thing that you can look at is something called quantum cryptography. And these are techniques that are based on quantum systems. So leveraging them for random number generators, uh, or the most famous example at the moment is quantum key distribution. But they're very different in how they are used and how they are applied and the fundamental systems underneath. So on the right, we're using properties of quantum mechanics to generate truly random numbers or to encrypt your data or transmit your keys. And on the left, we are using more traditional approaches to cryptography. So they are basically both methods, just very different in their infrastructure requirements, and they have ways of being quantum resilient. So when a quantum computer arrives on the scene, they rely on math problems that are not optimally solved by quantum computers. Go to the next slide. So I'm going to toss it back over to Nick on the policy and legal side since uh, your DHS background speaks. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Uh, well, so yeah. there's, there's one thing that I, I want to double click on that, that Elizabeth talked about, and that's the idea that what would, what would you do if you were the leader of a, of a nation that got to cryptographic relevance first? How many of you would, would hold a press conference and say, hey, look at, this, look at this great weapon that I have, right? So it's not going to be like having an aircraft carrier or a stealth bomber or a nuclear warhead where you want people to know that you have it. This is actually going to be a lot more analogous to Bletchley Park and the development of, of, uh, of the breaking for the, of, of the Enigma code. So as, we're as this is being developed, particularly in the West, it's being developed openly through the private sector, through our innovation sector, but that's not the case everywhere. And so when we're looking at some of the, a lot of the billions of dollars that are being thrown at this, they're not all being thrown at it in an open, transparent way. So while we, we think that we don't have, no one has an exact date, and if anybody tells you they have an exact date, they're wrong. But if, if the rough timeline, we think, within the next 10 years, at DHS, we put down a marker of 2030. We wanted to be ready by 2030. Now, we are one or two engineering breakthroughs away from that timeline getting shorter. And so it's important to remember that you know, when, this, when this breakthrough happens, we will know depending on who did it, not necessarily because it happened. So I want to talk about the policy and legal side here for a second, and um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, uh, I will admit that I am the guilty party behind um, DHS's uh, policy and transition roadmap, um, and a little bit of the one of the people behind National Security Memorandum 10. But so what we want to talk about here is recommendations, what what we want to do, but looking at it through the lens of what has the government prioritized, what has it said you're going to do. So there's a pretty straight line if you, if you start at uh, DHS's website. So there's dhs.gov uh, slash quantum. If you go to the website, please focus on the, um, not, not the look of the website. It is a government website, so please forgive the, its functionality. Um, but focus on the products. I promise they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're good. But um, the DHS policy pr basically put out seven, seven steps that organizations can take right now. And they, we can talk more about this, but it, it basically focuses around inventorying your cryptographic systems. Do you know what cryptographic systems are running on your network and where? And then creating a plan to transition. Because Elizabeth talked about this, right? We, if, if the plan for RSA was 10 years and it took 20, the NIST standards are coming out in 2024. And we're, we want to be ready by 2030. That's six years. You know, SHA-1 to SHA-2 was 15. So by that measurement, we're actually kind of behind. And so the first time that you think about transitioning your cryptography can't be when the NIST standard comes out. That should be when you push go on the transition plan that you've already created. So that DHS signed that out in October of 2021. After that, the, the White House called and called us to the principal's office, as it were, and said, hey, we were kind of thinking about doing something like this, but you guys already, are already, already got there, so what can we do? And we put down the first draft of what became National Security Memorandum 10, which expands on the DHS approach, but then goes further to uh, mandate it for the federal executive branch. That was carried into statute with the passage of the Quantum Cybersecurity Preparedness Act that passed in December of last year, sponsored by Representative Ro Khanna. If you look at all three of those documents, they look a lot alike, which is you know, maybe a bit of a, a, you know, a surprise for a government approach, but we were actually really aligned with this. So if you look at what's being, what is required, it's the transition of the asymmetric 
cryptography like what Elizabeth was talking about. So we, we are going to transition our public key cryptography to the NIST standards. And we're going to do so by prioritizing data, prioritizing connections, in DHS's case with critical infrastructure, or, you know, perhaps uh, national security systems, whatever it is you have, um, but prioritizing um, your, your transition and getting it done uh, starting with when the NIST standards roll out. You have the next slide? So, uh, so this, this, this goes over some of that. So here, you know, we're, we're talking about some of the things that, um, that are required in the National Security Memorandum. So, um, so May 5th, uh, the, the, which is soon, um, they are, are due, the, the inventories are due. I um, am not aware of the government being exactly on that timeline. Um, if they are, congratulations, and I'll take partial credit. If they're not, I will say that I was not involved. Um, so, uh, so... The other part is crypto agility, and this is something that we, we were really looking at at DHS for a while. The ability to, to kind of swap out cryptographic systems quickly. Software defined would be great. Even if you had to do it through hardware, that would be okay. But right now, there aren't so many uh, solutions out on the market that allow you to do this. And so ideally, you would be able to enter your procurement cycle and replace some of a legacy system with something that's crypto agile, but right now that there's not as much out on the market for that. So what, one of the things we would like to do is kind of, you know, create that, create that demand. Um, and then another requirement that I want to highlight uh, under, um, under the, that's in statute under uh, the Quantum Cybersecurity Preparedness Act is, that, uh, is, the, is the budget side. So government agencies are required to submit their budget proposals on what it would take to do the inventory and, and, and switch out their cryptographic systems 15 months from the passage of the law, which is about one year from now. So that is when uh, governments will be, or government agencies will be responsible for submitting to OMB, which will then submit to Congress, the budgets that it will take to get this done. So I want to highlight that as another important piece. Next slide, please. And then, uh, and then, so this timeline kind of wraps it, wraps everything up really well because th this is part of the product that we did um, that, that my team put together at DHS, where it says, I, what I like to do is actually look at that in reverse. So if 2030 is the day is is the year we say we want to be ready, 2024 is when the standards are going to be ready. That's a six year gap, right? To do a full cryptographic transition, that's that is a that is a difficult an ambitious ask. But it is really important because we get we start getting into 2030 and the threat that something might uh, an engineering breakthrough might get us to the place where uh, to cryptographic relevance becomes more and more real. And the the breaking of that of of, the, of prime number factorization, which is what RSA is bra is based on, would have significant effects to everything from, you know, our, our, our emails to financial transactions to everything that, that is, is public key encrypted. So I, I, I want to kind of, you know, leave you with this, this timeline and a couple of resources down there at the bottom in the green box. CISA is working on this. They have an initiative uh, that is staffed and resourced. Um, DHS's uh, guidance is out. Um, National Security Council and the White House did National Security Memorandum 10, and then it's also in law. So I would definitely recommend everybody uh, check those out because we've, we've talked about the threat, we've talked about the policy environment, and that's going to really help us define um, what, what we do going forward. Savaji, back to you. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, very enlightening, um, obviously. Uh, one of the things that uh, we are doing at this conference is having an exchange between government and industry. And one of the most important things is while we go walk down these aisles, we see a lot of quantum data, quantum security product solutions. Um, and we had spoken earlier about the fundamental difference between what they project and where we need to go in terms of the ultimate state of quantum security. What do you think are the stepping off points within where we are from a product maturity perspective and where we want to be? What is the pathway to go there? On the quantum encryption side? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it depends on which solution that you're looking at. For example, we, we know how to make cyber-hardened algorithms. NIST is in the process of writing standards, which means they've been doing... Um, rigorous testing since 2016, so that's you know they're not completely done with theirs, and I don't think they'll ever stop looking and testing them. So that's very close. On the quantum side, while some of that might sound very futuristic, these are things you can actually buy off the shelf. There are implementations, there's products, there's startups who are built up around them. If you're in the audience, I apologize for the review on quantum. Um, 
But there's, there's differences involved in some of them, right? So even if you can buy it off the shelf, a lot of them come with infrastructure, right? Which is hard to put under a crypto agile layer if you have, um, say, you need special fiber or you need a special box or you need this, that, and the other to run it. So if we're looking very clearly through the lens of what the government is looking for and asking for, um, it also, and I can let you get on your... We've been trading soapboxes um, about, <laughs> about the kinds of things they protect as well because the quantum solutions protect a part of it that we're not pretty much looking to worry about at the moment. So if you want to... <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, I think what I would say is, is key to this is understanding why this is a problem. And, and what, I, what I say to people a lot is, you know, if we were, if we were going to talk about, you know, uh, I, you know, your smartphone or something, I could say, hey, I got, I got this new smartphone and it's the 256 gigabyte instead of the, you know, 128 or whatever. Everybody understands actually probably deeper than you think what that means. But if I say, hey, there's a 433 qubit processor and, you know, they're projecting their next one to be whatever. Like the baseline understanding of that, I think, is, is what we're we're trying to create here. Is like why why are bits and qubits different? Why does it matter? And then to also impart that simply counting qubits in in uh, in quantum processors or something like that is an imperfect way to measure how far we are, how how far we're progressing. And so there are things like error correction that we have to really pay attention to. And, and honestly, right now we're not all that close to to be able to run applications. So, but as we approach that, as we're, as we're getting there, and, and again, this isn't a, you know, maybe we'll get there. This is a, the engineering is going to catch up to this at some point, but we are going to get to a place where um, the asymmetric public key encryption that we use uh, will be broken. And we, Elizabeth mentioned, you know, steal now, decrypt later. So, you know, if you're an adversary, you might pull down a bunch of data right now and just hold it. And we can all think of types of data that even in 10 years, you would still not want to be public, right? Like maybe your social security number or other, you know, um, you know government related things. So, um, so as this is happening, we have to prepare for the transition. And sure, there are solutions out there that, you know, can provide use case solutions like, um, like, an, like a symmetric encryption, for example, which is something that is, is, not, you know, is not going to be broken by the same algorithm within a quantum computer. But there is a policy and statutory requirement to transition the, the asymmetric encryption. So that is where the momentum is. That's where the government is going, is, is they're, putting, they're putting their weight behind asymmetric um, public key encryption. And there are, so NIST has developed a crata of, I think it's 15 companies now that are within industry. They're big, they're small, they're startups to, you know, key players, I'm going to try not to call out names in this environment, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. but they, they're building some of these framework tools. So there are things that exist on the market that you can run and get a dashboard of, hey, did you know that there was cybersecurity implementations to whatever your open source software you didn't even remember you installed over here has a cryptographic algorithm that's very vulnerable. And if you think you know all the cryptography on your systems, you don't. Mm -hmm. There is something buried somewhere that you do not expect in software you don't remember downloading. Um, but it's... That thought just ran off. But there's, there's many different versions of these solutions. So you have companies that are making framework and transition tools. You have companies that are working on the new cryptographic primitives. So it's, it's all, the ecosystem is happening. And I wanted to be clear about when we talk about engineering challenges, we're not like, okay, one day we'll find out how to cool a computer faster. Um, any quantum system can be turned into a computer. And so you can go from those big chandeliers. So that chandelier fits in something like this, that kind of scale, okay? But... There are photonic computers that are much more recent that went from a couple hundred computers to thousands of qubits, and they sit on desks. And there are implications to that, right? Their room temperature, there's thousands of qubits. Even the quantum computing industry doesn't agree on a valuable metric for a qubit because stability, accuracy, all these things are important. But you never know when someone wakes up in grad school and is like, oh my gosh, let's use photons, and the computer is this big now. And it doesn't need to be super cooled. Um, so it's not necessarily just like an engineering grind. All you need is one person with one good idea at some point. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So, so basically, it's still a research environment. Mm -hmm. While it's still a research environment till 2030, we still have to meet those deadlines being in the research environment. So it's very dynamic, and it's interesting how industry and government work together. They have to work together to get to that happy place by 2030, right? So the, the following question I have is, and address some part of it, we talk about cyber hygiene all day long. In the government, in the industry, is there a quantum hygiene that we should start looking at in the, in the, over the next, what, six years, uh, seven years? 
to get to a happy place for exactly the same threat you spoke about is store now, decrypt later kind of scenario? Well, I, I think there are a couple of things that, that organizations can can start doing now. And, 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 you know, some of them we've already talked about. So I think one is, you know, start to get to know your the, crypto, the cryptography that is on your system. Do your inventory. Start to understand what types of data, so inventory your data as well. What types of data do you hold? How valuable is that? Where does that, what is that data connected to? And start to prioritize and create a transition plan. So that is, I think, the, the, the first thing that is important for everyone else to do because this cannot hit us all in the face in 2024 when NIST says, okay, we're done. This has to be, okay, we're ready at 2024. If you can you know, build this into your procurement cycle, you can build this into your budgeting, this, that's, this is the time to do that, not two, three years from now when, we're already, when we've already lost time. So we're in, the, we're in the window now where you can do this and not lose time. The, the, the other thing that you can do, and, and again, this is not a, this doesn't solve the problem, but you can increase your key lengths on existing crypto, uh, encryption that you have. If you do that, it doesn't, again, it doesn't solve it. You are not quantum secure. Let me say that again. You, it is not <laughs> quantum proof at all if you do that. But you have improved, you have, you have created, uh, you have done some hygiene on your system to improve uh, where you are for, for quantum readiness. It's also worth pointing out that not every system is going to be able to be made quantum resilient. Um, I think you can think of some key government infrastructure that is written in language that doesn't, that is not going to work. (laughs) That transition is not going to happen. So the identification of legacy systems that have to be mitigated and not migrated and how best to mitigate them is going to be a whole different can of worms. Some of these systems are critical. And there's a reason we haven't updated them in a while. Um, but it's, it's another threat that you have to be aware of. Is okay, if I cannot migrate it, how am I going to mitigate that problem? What is going to be involved? Um, the other concern, and I'm going to speak to this, but a very boring nuts and bolts IT problem. Who remembers the last like Microsoft patch that wiped out your corporate email for a day? Right, like, the, the, and we're talking about migrating massive scales across whole, la- like the, the level of intricacy of this progress is boring on a nuts and bolts scale, but does need to be addressed. So even if you do this inventory, even if you do things like that, you're going to have to prioritize what goes first. What has dependencies that I can address now? What has dependencies that I can't address now? And there's a huge amount of prioritization along those lines of key legacy systems or fast to migrate, but not very vulnerable. Um, And also there's no algorithm or method that NIST is working on that you can just yank what you have out and plug that right back in you are going to fundamentally have to change that underlying architecture, which is why we're moving towards crypto resilience, because we are aware that these things will probably be broken eventually in some manner. So we are trying to make it easier in that way in the future. But to <laughs> sound, I feel like a very boring person saying, if you undermine the IT risk of this process, <laughs> it's, going to, like, it's going to be like trying to work from home at the beginning of COVID, but with all of your data blankly available. Um, so we're talking about very large transitions that impact you know, your network speeds, your handshake times, the computational load of these keys. So Nick can say, you know, oh, double your key length, which sounds fine, but that's going to slow everything down. That's going to take up computational power. That's going to take up data storage power. Um, When we get into the real cryptographic algorithms that are quantum resilient, those are massively heavy. Maybe not all of your data even needs them. Something that's got a very short secure lifestyle might not, or timeline might not need something that heavy hitting because they are slower. There is a lot more infrastructure around them just on a network latency side, on a compute requirement side that you're going to have to analyze and prioritize across. There's no, there will never be a button that's like, we'll just, let's use lattice-based learning across everything and everything will slow down. So there's more complicated layers underneath it once you get past the really cool encryption algorithm on the boring IT side. (laughs) Well, and and what I would add is that you know, this is not going to be the last time that we transition cryptography. So when RSA first came out, you know, it, it you know, the, the, the computing time required, you know, to, to break an RSA private key was in, on the order of, you know, billions of years of continuous computing time. And so everybody said, okay, that's good enough. Like, we can, we can say that that is practically good enough. Well, a, a cryptographically relevant quantum computer running Shor's algorithm takes that down to a couple of minutes. And no one foresaw that. No one thought, oh, well, you know, that's, that's where we're, you know, we need to build an encryption algorithm that anticipates this quantum computing that none of us understand yet that, for, with, that runs an algorithm that hasn't been invented yet. So 
this is not going to be the last time that we do this. So one of the one of the things we want to focus on is cryptographic agility, right? So we want to we want to build that into systems um, because we're going to have to do this again, and we don't want to have it be quite as heavy and as long as as it's going to be this time. And then, you know, as Elizabeth said, not everything is necessarily going to be able to be uh, transitioned or you might not want to. I mean, maybe there are certain things that you make a decision to say RSA is good enough. I'm, I'm not concerned about a nation state with a cryptographically relevant quantum computer reading my search history for cat videos and <laughs> recipes, right? Or maybe you are. I don't know. But I mean, it, but not everything is necessarily going to have to have that. So thinking across infrastructure and thinking across, you know, your, your architecture is, is really interesting because there is a bit of a like, are we, are we going to do all of it? Are we going to do some of it? But for sure, you're going to have to do it again. So keep in mind that, you know, the problem that we're dealing with now, we're, we're going to use this you know, NIST is going to use this lattice learning with errors, uh, you know, math problem, you know, in, encryption algorithm that is really, really complicated and really, really difficult. But there's going to be, you know, some grad student that wakes up and says, hey, I have an idea for an algorithm that breaks that in a couple of minutes. So don't think this is the last time. But um, so, so that's why the, the inventory work is actually going to pay off for you, um, not just once, but into the future as well. So it's an investment worth making. Thanks, Nick. So switching gears, uh, let's spark cyber for a second and talk about quantum information processing. We, this crew spoke about this last year when we spoke about how quantum science helps in healthcare simulations. So let's talk about some of the use cases out there uh, which are right in front of us, which we can uh, get ready for or, or see at least. I think it's important to remember that there are two kinds of use cases that we're going to talk about. Um, so quantum computing, as we've mentioned, is not cryptographically relevant. So we don't have those, you know, where was the picture of the classical computer with the floppy disk that it boots from? That's where we are on the quantum scale, okay? So when we talk about quantum communications, think ARPANET, think floppy disks, we're back down here. We're thinking ahead, though, to when we have, you know, MacBook Pro quantum computers. So there's use cases that we know we can do over here, like breaking Shor's algorithm, you know, modeling the entire electric grid of the United States could be done on one of these computers. In the meantime... We can't do that, but we're going to kind of try to address both. There are some things that you can solve on computers today. For example, you can do molecular simulations, drug discovery. Um, if you think AI can discover new drugs quickly, watch what it can do when you have quantum machine learning running on a quantum computer. However, if you remember those lovely colored charts about all the different ways that quantum is weird and unusual, writing an algorithm in that space is very difficult. Um, you know, you can explore this massive parameter space, but you have to tweak it to collapse it just into the right answer that you want to get, and then you have to do it repeatedly to make sure it's a statistically correct answer. So there's a lot of physics that goes into these kinds of algorithms. So we don't want to wait the whole thing. We don't want to wait for this computer to be ready, right? We want to learn how to program on these and try them out. But in the meantime, with these, you can do you can do like computational fluid dynamics optimizations. Now there are people who are testing optimal flows, you can design propellers, for example, and test, you know, optimal spreads of uh, wind turbines or sensor distribution around cars. So uh, they're not the most glamorous, right? You could also do that at AWS on a very large selection of classical requirements, but you can do them faster. And the important part is we're answering it differently as well. So a quantum machine learning algorithm and model are never going to give you the same results as a classical one there are different features that are accessible to you on the quantum space. So even when you can do things on the same side, you can get extra information when you use a quantum computer sometimes or you can optimize differently. Um, but what's nice is that we're working on those problems here when you're like, okay, maybe this propeller, is, we designed it faster. But later that's going to turn into how do I redesign a submarine? How do I, and while I'm doing that, I'm going to calculate a new chemical compound to coat the outside to minimize biofouling. And there's a lot of things along those lines. Quantum computers are best for simulating quantum systems. You do not want to use a quantum computer for Excel. That would be a nightmare, and it would take forever. So it's thinking about different types of problems. So when you look at chemical, biological, material simulation, those things are very well oriented to quantum computers, along with optimization problems, so like traffic flow, routing, packing things into containers, which sounds boring, but is a very important and very financially heavy question. Um, financial systems modeling. Um, if you want an industry that's invested more money in quantum than the government, it's finance, because we can protect things better and we can model things better, and that's a gold star for them. 
Um, I'll toss it over to you so I don't yeah. talk too much. <laughs> no, it's all right. So, I, I, yeah, I mean, the, the approach I'm, I'm going to take to this is, I mean, I think, you know, she's covered some really great specific you know, use cases under, you know, kind of quantum simulation. And this is, you know, absolutely one of the most exciting things, I think, on the opportunity side here. Um, but the, the angle that I want to take is we're going to have to, when, when we're watching the development of quantum computing, when you, when you see a, a press release or something like that and, you know, Google says, oh, well, we've got, you know, this many more qubits or IBM says we got this many more qubits. The thing to really pay attention to there is error correction. So if you, if you see a press release about a breakthrough in error correction, that is what's actually going to get us closer to be able to run applications and to uh, take advantage of these use cases than the actual number of qubits. So I, I had the opportunity to visit uh, Google's um, Quantum Lab uh, last year for an error correction breakthrough event that they had, and they were basically able to say that using surface code error correction, they were able to scale up um, error correction across multiple qubits, right? They, they did it on one, they were able to do it on, on more. Um, the threshold that they are looking at to be able to run uh, applications effectively is 10 to the negative six, right? So we're, we're talking about, that. that's the error threshold that we're gonna have to achieve in order to get to um, the ability to run some of the applications that we're talking about here at that larger scale. Now, like, like she said, we can do some things now, but we're doing it, we're doing it floppy disk style. When, when we're talking about scaling up, we're, we're still a few years away from that, but pay attention to error, error correction, right? And the, the, you know, the error correction the, uh, through logic gates, things like that, that's what we really want to look at. And then also looking at um, the cryogenic side. So particularly for transmon qubits, that is um, kind, of a, kind of a bottleneck where, uh, you know, there's like a limited number of companies that do it, um, and it's extremely, extremely hard to do. And so um, that's a, like a, you know, a, call it maybe a vulnerability point uh, for the development of, of uh, qubits, particularly those that have to be cooled um, to that level. To tack onto that, though, fabricating qubits is still very much an art and not a science. So um, companies like Intel that are looking at what's a scalable fabrication approach, um, someone who has error correction but no way to make more than one qubit every three weeks is not going to reach a scalable computer either. And for fun, since you, you kind of mentioned just information science broadly, I'm going to hop on a, like, a different hobby horse, which is we, we talk about quantum computing all the time, but in quantum sensing and quantum communications, there are different things that will impact cybersecurity. Um, there are RF sensors that are about this big that can sample the entire band, all of it. You have to tune across it, but they can access everything, and they're about this big. So you don't see them, you don't know they're there, they're extremely low swap, and they can go on all kinds of environments. So cybersecurity directly, no. Communication security, yes. People are suddenly able to pick up bands you don't think they were in places you weren't expecting. Um, quantum communications is also a tentative further out thing, but those properties you were talking about before, if you have data that's in all, you don't have to encrypt quantum data, theoretically. We're going to be testing that in the field, but theoretically you don't have to because when you're transmitting this data, it's not encoded. It's sitting in superposition, so it's every value at once. And if someone tries to copy it, they get a random answer. So they literally can't take your data. If they try to read it at all, it's something random, so you don't have to worry about encryption. And you can do this wonderful thing with entanglement where if you send one photon off into the world encoded with data and you monitor this one, if someone tries to mess with this one while it's in flight, you will know immediately. And that means you can go, oh, hey, time of flight. I know where that person is. I know what they're listening to. And you can respond on a cyber sort of, your cyber response is incredibly different because it's live, it's targeted. If you're worried about people downloading lots of data, you'll know where it is and what data they are going after. Um, this is difficult, right? Just like quantum computing is difficult. But these networks are being built around the world. So this is not, I think what it's, if, if there was one takeaway, this is clo it sounds far away, it's still R&D, but it's closer than you expect. Europe is building networks across um, the entire country. British Telecom, for example, has a network that they are running in Cambridge with Cambridge University. These, we have one in Chattanooga that's being run by a utility company. We've got ones at NIST. We've got one we're building in D.C. So there are quantum communications networks all over the world in deployment. Seoul has one protecting government infrastructure. Um, which is weird because we don't talk about it very often and it is still very much an R&D thing, but it is an R&D thing with incredible value. So it is being pushed very quickly and very well funded. Um, so there are other threats beyond quantum computing out there that are worth bearing in mind. Yeah, and, and what I would add is that, 
like another aspect, and you know, she's talking about like sensing and things like that. Uh, timing. So. <laughs> Resilient timing is is something that is extremely important, and it's something that in the the, the 2018 uh, Coast Guard Authorization Act, actually they actually tasked out to the Department of Transportation to say, you have to find resilient timing uh, that's not GPS, and so Quantum provides extremely accurate timing, and so that could be another application that we see in use uh, broadly. Is um, again, it's not. It's not computing, but it's the, the use of, of quantum timing for networks could also be another use case that would be really important. Cool, thank you. Um, before I get to our next question, I would encourage you to get ready with your, your own questions, uh, which we'll address to the panel. So, uh, what kind of infrastructure changes are required to be you know, quantum secure, quantum ready, and stuff like that, while we build all the centers of excellence? Uh, <laughs> In, in piecemeal, so to say. So, where do you think you're going with that? Elizabeth, since you are the scientist, why do you start? I mean, I, if you talk about sort of resilience to quantum computing, that really is basically, and I, I hate to say this, it's, a, it's an IT question, right? <laughs> like, you, need, you need to just build up the capability, like the, your infrastructure has to be able to handle these new capabilities. If you want to talk about, okay, and I want to plug a quantum comms network in around all my data, then you're talking about different level. So I'd say if you want to just say, I'm doing PQC, I'm going to go by the government guidebook, I'm going to drop the NIST standards, I'm going to do my inventory, you need the standard things which are money, time, and software refactoring. <laughs> um, but if you want to go into comms or sensing, you need sometimes different infrastructure, different transmitters or receivers. We're working on getting those on the backs of classical networks because no one wants to relay hundreds of thousands of miles of fiber. So it's, it's a it's a very broad question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, That's I, why we have the policy guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, no, I, I mean, I, I think what I would encourage is, you know, again, this is, this is going to sound much more like a policy guy answering, but you know, guilty as charged. So I, you know, I think it's if if you can use this opportunity to to become more crypto crypto agile. This is the time to do that, right? So if you can create a demand for your, from your vendors, from whatever system it is that you're running, to say, we want to be able to have this system, we want to replace this system, but we want it to be crypto agile. Maybe we can do it software defined, which would be even better. Maybe we can do it you know, through hardware, whatever it has to look like. But mm -hmm. using this opportunity uh, for that will actually set you up not just for the next, you know, 10 years, which we're kind of tracking for, uh, you know, the emergence of quantum computing, but actually even beyond that, because as I said before, you're, this is not the last time you're going to have to do it. So using this opportunity to actually bring in some infrastructure that is uh, crypto agile will benefit you for, for many, many years ahead. Also, if you're looking forward, right, we talk about 5G or 6 day. how do you ensure that that infrastructure is crypto agile? When you're developing applications or software or a new kind of software-defined network, can you make that something you don't also then have to add into the bucket of things you redo? So sort of rethinking about how you look at cybersecurity and product development moving forward. And the other key and often unlooked, uh, overlooked thing is usually the biggest threat to cybersecurity is your workforce. Um, so I'm going to go the, the workforce development track as well because an un <laughs> you can do everything right and if your workforce doesn't know what they need to be avoiding or not downloading or not using, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so trying, and I think it's part of why we're here as well, is to kind of like start banging the gong of the world is changing weirdly fast in ways we didn't expect it to. I mean, this, this panel three years ago we wouldn't have had, but in three years the amount of things that have changed is dramatic. Um, so I'd say getting education out there as well and then tasking your engineers as they're moving forward. Okay, you want to make this product, make it agile. Not, and not software agile, crypto agile. <laughs> well, and and I, what I would add to that is I, I think that the, the workforce part is so important because some of the use cases that you are going to find in your, in your uh, organization or, or for your clients or something like that are likely going to come from the people that are kind of in the organization who are, who are you know, managing the programs or, or developing the tech or whatever. And having those folks understand quantum, not just that it exists or that it's coming, but what it really means. And what, th those, are, those are the folks that are going to be able to find those new opportunities for you. And so having a workforce that, uh, you know, a current workforce that you're able to upskill in quantum is really going to be a huge advantage for your organization. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, 
So, uh, I think you turn on any news outlet on TV today, you hear about the AI apocalypse, uh, apocalypse right? Uh, and there is a quantum apocalypse that we speak about also. And what if there's a quantum AI apocalypse? How does that even work? <laughs> and what does that look like? I Means. So you're talking about like convergence, like yeah, a quantum and AI. Yeah. 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 So I, man, a, can we have one apocalypse at a time? Oh <laughs> we should all go home now. Yeah, I, I mean, I actually think that's I think that's an exciting thing, right? I, I think the idea of being able to bring these two things together is is exciting. And, you know, I, you, you hear about AI and you hear about, you know, like the, the six-month pause or, you know, those things that, that have been in the news and, you know, the, the fear that, you know, there's, you know, uh, issues with workforce or things like that. But I think the thing that we would see more is AI that could... Um, you know, synthesize data, create create recommendations, find patterns, do these things that can allow you as the expert to be an expert and not have to sift through data or do other types of other types of work. You can focus on the problem. You can be creative, and I think the same thing happens when you bring that when you bring quantum into the into the equation. You 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 create these these really interesting. Um, efficiencies that are going to help improve your organization. So I, I actually think it's, it's exciting, um, but I, I'm curious what the scientist has to say. Uh, I would say that the two revolutions on their own are probably exciting enough. Um, one thing that we didn't mention when we talk about these things, and AI is one of the things that you can speed up with a quantum computer. As we said, they can't do everything. But along the lines of error correction, a very quick and easy way of getting classical data into a quantum computer has not been discovered. We don't even have good ideas. Like, this is so... I mean, there, there have been trial tests. You can look at um, companies like Rigetti or IonQ. They've done trial tests of solar weather prediction and, you know, uh, space satellite imagery analysis where they can... If you can get the data in there, they can handle a lot of data very, very quickly. They can train networks very, very quickly. But encoding an image into a quantum computer is a very difficult question. <laughs> so sometimes it's, it's weird thinking about quantum computers can factor numbers in a heartbeat, but they're sitting there very carefully trying to get a qubit to be stable long enough to say this pixel is red. Um, and so there's, it's different challenges. So one of the things we will have to wait for, I think, is if we want to keep applying them towards classical things, that'll be a lag. But they're, they're both enabling technologies, so together they will just enable a few more things. You'll get more depth of it. You'll get it faster. You'll get more depth of knowledge from it. Um, Again, I don't think they're apocalypses. I think we make them into apocalypses <laughs> with how we use them and how we don't expect them. Agreed. Perfect. So um, the last question I have is, uh, and, and you covered a little bit of this, uh, but I'd like to ask, ask that again so that our industry friends can actually write it down possibly, <laughs> is what are the three to five things the industry needs to do to get ready for potential opportunities in this space? Yeah, so I mean, I think that uh, w one of the reasons that you know, DHS and the government kind of went down the road of, of quantum cryptography and the, the threat to asymmetric cryptography is it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the things that's, gonna, that's probably the closest to us, and it's something that we can take action on now. And so I think one of the first things is, I, I, you know, I don't want to be the one that's like, oh, everything's bad, right? Like, that's not, that's, it's not that at all. But there is a legitimate thing that we do need to concern ourselves with and be ready for. So I think one thing is get your transition plan done. And look at that transition plan and find out how you're going to implement it across your organization. So go through, do the hard work, and, and you know, create your inventory, look at your dependencies, look at your data, and make your plan. So I think that's, that's one, maybe two things. Um, and then another is, is the key length issue. So if you, can, if you can increase your key length, you can do it smartly, you can do it to where you're not going to you know, grind your network to a halt. That's another thing that you can do right now. So if you go to uh, dhs.gov slash quantum, there's a, a, a graphic there that has seven steps. And those are seven steps that DHS itself is taking. So DHS's policy is actually also publicly available on that website. So you can put the two side by side. Um, you can go through, do those steps, and, and find ways to make yourself more quantum ready. So I think that's where I would start. Um. I mean, I'm not going to argue with the guy who wrote the seven-step plan. <laughs> um, some things that I do want to mention coming from an industry side is uh, there's a level of corporate buy-in that you need to achieve to convince people that this is worth spending time and money and resources on. Um, if I spend any time complaining at anybody, it's there's never enough time, there's never enough money to do anything you want. And I think it is a mistake to look at this just as a, well, there could be this terrifying computer that breaks some of our encryption and that would be bad. It's 
it's kind of just like upgrading cybersecurity as a field. So thinking of it just as a quantum threat, it's, you know, the next time something is broken, the next time a threat comes out or a change happens, how well are you positioned to respond? So it's a, I would almost say to, to pull it back from the quantum a little bit, even though that makes me sad, but just there's nothing in that plan that isn't just good common sense right now. Identifying stuff you don't know is on your networks is a great thing to do from a cybersecurity point. And a lot of what's falling out of these inventories is people surprised by software that's running in places they didn't expect, which is never good. Um, so everything about it is basically good hygiene. Even if you do all of the right things but don't implement you know, the lattice kinds of cryptography that are very heavy, understanding what legacy systems are there and what kind of data they have and how vulnerable it is and maybe you don't actually need to protect it. Maybe that data is about a war that happened 60 years ago and we don't care. Um, there are things that just make general common sense. So there's ways to dial chunks of it back and still be ready, even if you're not going full force into the, the quantum era. But I think anything that you can do to become more crypto agile as you move forward, if you are government facing, this is going to happen to you at some point. <laughs> at some point, their mandates will become your mandates and you will have to be compliant with something that does not exist yet, but it will. So anything you can do to sort of be prepared to be in that position, even if it's like, well, we have an inventory, we know what we definitely can't migrate, we've taken steps to protect that, now what standards do you want me to use? There's, you don't even have to do the whole process. There's ways to just address it however much you can that makes sense. So the, the last thing I, I want to add to that is just kind of a context piece. <laughs> and the context around everything that's going on with quantum computing is that there's geopolitical impl implications to all of this. So this is very, very much being viewed as a nation state capability by nation states who have a lot of money. And so if you, whether you are you know, a, a quantum company yourself or you, you want to have use cases or you want to you know, touch quantum in some way, th there is going to be a geopolitical flavor to, to all of it. So whether you're, if you're a government person and this is what you do for a living, or if you're an industry person and you're, you're doing R&D, what you're doing is going to be geopolitically valuable to adversaries. So keep that in mind. This is, this is not a like, you know, we'll, we'll let the government deal with what the government deals with and industry will deal with what industry deals with. Like this is such a perfect example of something that has to be worked together mm -hmm. um, and not just in a vendor contractor sort of way, but in a, in a like development, in a research and development kind of way, because there are, uh, there are efforts underway to gain an advantage in this area. And if they were to happen in the kind of Bletchley Park, you know, analogy that we talked about, if that was to happen, you know, if that, you know, if that, if you, if you were the, the dictator and you decided, no, I'm not going to hold a press conference, right? If that did happen, and we were surprised or we were a couple of years behind when something like this was real, we would, you know, we would be at a serious disadvantage and it wouldn't matter if it just happened to the government or to universities or to industry. So this is a, a perfectly compatible issue for, for all sectors to work together on. I think we didn't mention it, but Europe has its own version of this policy. For example, they have standards that they are working on as well. This is a global concern. This isn't America standing up going like, hey, maybe we should be worried about this. Um, NATO has a quantum computing agreement and standards organization body called Diana. Um, AUKUS contains things about this. Five Eyes does. If it's not a, and you, I think you can start getting the flavor of where some of these lines are falling, but it's very much a the strategic advantages of a lot of these technologies would be sort of paradigm shifting, which is why people are paying attention. And there is a single country that is basically funding 50% of the world's quantum budget internally. I'm not going to point fingers. I don't think I particularly need to, but like the global spending budget is 50% allocated in one country and it's not us. So if you want to get an idea of just the scale of that discrepancy, right, that's kind of what you're looking at. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, guys. Any questions? Let me take questions now. Uh, Dan, I think the mic is up. This, sir. Great presentation. I loved it. Uh, two questions. One is, if you, depending on what you read out of uh, NIST and the folks on the other side of the airport, uh, elliptic curve does provide some um, quantum resilience and the new algorithms will. I'm hearing none of that is true. We don't even know what will be resilient. Is that correct? 
That's mm-hmm. anyone who says I don't know anything or I know all things makes me inherently nervous. One thing that doesn't help is that a lot of these families of things like there is something with Diffie Hillman in the name that is quantum resilient. There is also a lot of things with Diffie Hillman in the name that are not, which does not help the conversation. Fully homomorphic encryption has some primitives that are and are not. So it is a very complicated conversation. And there are things that we can say, we are pretty sure, based on how we know quantum computers work, that they won't be able to break this. But I'm pretty... The uh, temperament of some of the people you are alluding to, if you cannot prove it, why would you say this is provably quantum secure, right? We don't actually know 100... You can't really know 100% that something is definitively unbreakable. Think about the amount of times unbreakable... Like, things in the NIST algorithms broken in 24 hours with a laptop, right? So I don't think anyone is going to commit and say, this is 100% non-computer breakable. Even if, you know, quantum computers can't help you find random numbers quickly. There's no algorithm for that. But if there is a seed or a pattern behind your random number generator, they will find that. So it's a very nuanced conversation, which is why we all try to tread very carefully around it. Um, But I don't think you'll find anyone willing to stake their career on a definitive statement. (laughs) And that's why I said probably resilient. So my other question is, if you could expand on crypto, crypto agile. And I I get everything there except the last phrase with with little notice. And I come from a background that included moving from 1024 to 2048, moving SHA-1 to SHA-2, and all the rest of that. Much of what we do in the crypto world is transactional. So what I do, if the other side doesn't do the same, we become mm-hmm. interoperable, right? And we've seen even within the government even within DOD, some interoperability problems because we're not all on the same track. How, how would you define with little notice and, uh, oh, yeah, little notice, and, and um, you know, how much, because quite frankly, very few who couldn't notice what was going on caused delays in many of those changes we were trying to promote. So it's, it always, you know, the squeaky wheel gets, gets the worm, right? <laughs> I'm going I'm to use that one. Um, <laughs> no, uh, no, I, I appreciate the question. So, I mean, I think what it means is not like with little notice doesn't necessarily mean a, a, a time frame as much as it means pre- previous cryptographic transitions. What, how we understand cryptographic transitions that we've done before is going to be different in a quantum computer era, and so with little notice could mean c- could mean a lot of things. I don't think I don't think we have a timeline, but what it definitely means is that. You know, we, we, she was just talking about like the ability of a, of a, you know, to break this encryption algorithm or that one. Well, the quantum computer has to run Shor's algorithm to break prime number factorization, right? It has to run this algorithm. So at some point in the future, I'm sure there's going to be, you know, a new algorithm, the Iwasawa algorithm or whatever, <laughs> that is going to, you know, break all the encryption. So I think it's, I think it's about if there is a development of a new algorithm that shows up in an era where we have a cryptographically relevant quantum computer, how we understand cryptographic transitions is going to be different. So it won't be like, hey, we have 15 years to do this. It's going to be that that timeline is going to be compressed. Now, I don't know what that number is, but I think that's what that statement is, is more getting toward is that those that transition time is going to be different than we've previously understood it. You won't have a 15-year policy statement coming out about it. It will be okay. This is dead. Yeah. Um, and, and I will be. I did yank that straight from the documentation. So that, <laughs> that is someone else's with little notice that we are. Go ahead. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is John Krishnapa, Tech Innovation. So uh, Nick, uh, this is for Shivaji and Nick. Um, so my question is, uh, in terms of, uh, let me take it out. Okay. In terms of. Uh, um, DHS is uh, enforcing or pushing this post-quantum uh, cryptography, right? The big boys like Microsoft, AWS, and IBM are the ones who lead in taking the technology in a certain way, correct? Uh, even though as a small firm, I could be a, as good as whatever, but end of the year, in the long run, the big boys are the ones who's going to win. Can you please, do you, do you understand what my question is? Why would I spend a lot of time and energy and money in uh, getting this technology where the big boys probably has that going on as we speak? 
And I'm, I'm not sure why DHS is pushing for small firms to get good at this. So let, let me try and answer the first and then we'll have the expert answer that. So interestingly, this, as uh, everybody is alluding to, this is largely a research-based opportunity right now for small businesses. As an example, as most of you know, AFRL released uh, opportunity to submit white papers for a uh, for about a $500 million set aside for research-based uh, white papers on quantum to fund that research. So there are opportunities right now for small businesses to uh, put papers in, and incidentally, it is a small business set aside. So only small business can go after that. So Yeah, so I mean, I, I, so first I, I want to be really clear on one thing. point you said. You said DHS is enforcing. DHS is absolutely not enforcing. So there is no statute that is enforceable that is demanding that industry do anything. So the policy, even the Quantum Cybersecurity Preparedness Act, applies to the federal government. It doesn't apply to others, right? So there's not an enforceable, you know, st structure there where you're going to get in trouble if you don't do it. At least not yet. Um, so, uh, and I'm not aware of that also, to be very clear. And then, and then... As far as the, you know, you talked about the big boys. So, I mean, they're going to have to make this transition in order to stay in business the same way that you would have to if you were a small company. So what you would be doing is taking the cryptographic algorithms that NIST puts out. You would be imp implementing them kind of just the same as everyone else. Now, I'll, I, I can fully understand that it's going to be easier for them because they have the resources. But this is going to be a, a, a cost that everyone is going to bear. And it's not great, but, I mean, it's just that's where the science is taking us. I mean, it's, it's less of a development question. You can either do your own inventory or there are companies you can pay to do it for you. It's, it's, it's at some point you have to clean the house, right? Yep. Anyway, thank you so much for the panel. I think that's all the time we have for today. We've gone over time. Thank you again.